uh, the new year, but I want to share the theme with you today. I'll share the theme verse next Sunday, uh, but I'm going to share the theme with you this morning. As uh, we enter this new year, the theme for 2023 is trust in Him. Let's say that together, trust in Him. And we're going to learn this year what it means to abide in Christ and to trust in Christ every step of the way as uh, we go closer and closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, uh, you'll see in this passage a wonderful challenge and really a wonderful lesson on what it means to trust in the Lord. And so let's look at this as we turn to Psalm 56 and verse number one. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up he fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me. O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears in thy bottle, are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Amen. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? How many of you can tell this is a wonderful psalm this morning? And let's dig into it and see how it will help us as we trust in the Lord this year. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to gather here together. And we're asking you, Lord, to help us to trust you more in 2023. Many people in our church and in our Christian community have trusted in their plans and in themselves and in some internet uh, teacher or uh, something found on the internet as a way for them to get through. But Lord, would you help us this year to return to you, to trust you in every decision, to trust you in every circumstance. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we enter 2023, each and every one of us must decide if we will enter 23 trusting God or trusting self. Those are the two choices. Will I trust God in the new year, or will I simply trust myself in the new year? Many people today are making decisions based on their sense of what is right, based on what they think is fair, based on how they think they can survive with their own mentality. I heard of a man who asked his wife the other day, he said, if I won the lottery, what would you do? She said, well, if you won the lottery, I'd take my half and leave you. He said, great, I won $12, here's six of it, stay in touch. I'm afraid there are a lot of people, if they could just figure out a way, they would mess up their life in short order. They would find an exit that does not please God. They would find their will and miss God's will. And I wanna to submit to you this morning that time is too short to trust yourself. What is life, the Bible says? It is but a vapor. It appears for a little while and it vanisheth away. 
And it doesn't matter who you are. In just a few, a few days ago, one of the popes passed away. And just a few weeks before that, the queen passed away. And many celebrities in 2022 went on into eternity. I submit to you that life is short and that every day should be spent trusting God as we travel this way. Now, some people say to me, well, I'm just going to trust my gut, you know, my gut instincts. How many of you have heard that? And uh, how many of you realize that that's probably not the best way to live your life, just to trust your gut? In fact, sometimes uh, when we hear people say that regarding uh, very important decisions, uh, it's, it's cause for concern because uh, many times our guts are full of questionable advice. And many times people that make gut decisions uh, are making a fleshly decision. For example, consider with me this morning the ultimate red velvet cheesecake that is served at the Cheesecake Factory. And some of you have a lot in your gut on January 1st. Come on. This particular piece of delicious cheesecake, I want you to think of this, clocks in at 1,540 calories per piece. That is the equivalent of three McDonald's cheeseburgers and a box of Skittles. That's a lot of calories. And yet your gut is calling out for things like that, even today, is it not? All through the holiday season, this is something that we're told we're supposed to eat when we're finished with our real meal. We're told that the ultimate red velvet cheesecake is exactly the kind of thing that someone's gut can get excited about. And how many of you would say by this time in the holidays, Pastor, I don't need any red velvet cheesecake. Can I get an amen on that? But just as sure as you get around it, your gut starts telling you otherwise. A lot of people make gut decisions. This morning, we're here to make spiritual decisions. We're here to learn how to trust in God even more. Now, this morning, as we come to Psalm 56, we're studying a portion of the life of David, a time in David's life when he was going through difficulty and trials. Most of us remember David as the shepherd boy with a heart after God. We remember him rushing into his brethren as they were there in the valley of Elah and they were cowering before Goliath. And, and he said, is there not a cause? And he spoke up to his brethren. And of course, he won that victory over Goliath. And we think of the great victory there in 1 Samuel 17. And, and we marvel at the faith and at the walk that David had. He was a man after God's own heart. But when you read throughout 1st and 2nd Samuel, you also discover that David was a man who had many fears, and he was also a man who had many failures in his life. And it's interesting, the title at the beginning of the psalm that we're about to read gives us a little clue into one of those times of trials in David's life. Some of you may have those titles in the uh, margin of your Bible. It says in my Bible, the Schofield Bible, uh, the chief musician upon uh, and then notice this word here, Jonath Elam Rekokim, uh, which means the silent dove of far off places. The silent dove of far off places. David is being referred to in this psalm as the silent dove in a far off place. Now, why would that be attributed to David? A silent dove? I thought he was a mighty slayer of giants. In a far off place, I thought he was the king who lived in Jerusalem. Well, when you study the life of David, there are two times that David actually fled Jerusalem and lived in the territory of the Philistines. The first time, David was afraid of Saul and he went to Achish, the king of Gath. And we find in 1 Samuel 21 and verse 10, it says, David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him and dance his saying, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. So here is David, the man after God's own heart, the man that had killed a bear and a lion and Goliath, and he is hiding in the territory of the Philistines, afraid of Saul and afraid of Achish, the leader of the Philistines. 
In chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, we find David hiding in what are known as the caves of Adullam. And these caves are not far from the Dead Sea and just uh, somewhat south of Jericho. And you can discover and even go inside these caves today. This is known as the caves of Adullam where David hid uh, in a faraway place like a lonely dove hiding, if you will, from uh, these powers that would take his life. The second time that David went into hiding was when David went to Achish after he had opportunity to kill Saul in the caves of Adullam. And David chose to go back into the Philistines' territory with 600 of his mighty men, and this time he asks Achish if he can have a settlement or a place to bring his men. And he was given a little village or place known as Ziklag. And some of you have read about Ziklag and the exploits of Ziklag and how David went from there to fight uh, the enemies of the Jews. And, and uh, this place, which was again just somewhat south of, of uh, Jerusalem in the territory of the Philistines, was another place uh, where David was uh, in refuge, if you will, from the threatenings of Saul. And so it is. He is in this place, Janthel, Miracle, Kim, uh, which means the silent dove of far off places. And while in Philistia, David felt like a dove in strangers' hands. This psalm is a psalm of vulnerability. In fact, you might have heard the words of David a moment ago when he said, at what time I am afraid. David afraid? David who killed Goliath? David who killed a bear and a lion? David says to us through the word of God, at what time I am afraid? We see the vulnerability of this dove in a faraway place. This one that had flown to the territory of the Philistines to find refuge from Saul, this ungodly man filled with wrath and rebellion who was seeking his life. And so it is that in this chapter, we see a man who had to learn again how to trust in him. Now you have had times in your life when you were strong. You felt impenetrable. You felt as though your health was always to be good and your finances were fine and, and, and you felt uh, perhaps that you, you, your family was good and, and you know where you're going and boy, you have everything just planned out and everything is fine. But suddenly, a Saul can come into your life and suddenly a circumstance can come into your life and, and suddenly you can find yourself like David saying, at what time I am afraid. And so I want you to notice with me this morning why we all must trust him more in 2023. If you have your outline, notice first of all, the reality of fear. It says in this passage very clearly in verse number three, at what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. He, he doesn't say uh, that he's not afraid. He doesn't act like he has no issue or problem. And friends, I want us to just pause as we enter 2023, we're well aware that our country is careening away from God. We're well aware that this world with its globalistic anti-Christ views is developing a, a sense of hatred towards the things of God. We're well aware that teenagers are being targeted by the enemy on the internet. We're aware of the economic uncertainty, threats against religious liberty. And at times when we say and sense these things, there may come into the heart of a believer fear. It is not wrong when you have some form of fear. It is only wrong to live in the state of fear. And this is what David is telling us, that when you have something come across your heart that is of concern, at that moment we must learn to trust in him. At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Now why was David fearful? Notice, if you would, the presence of his enemies. We see the presence of enemies in verse number two. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. 
David was aware of his adversaries. He said, they would swallow me up if they could. They would like to erase me from this planet. David had fled from Saul and now is in Philistia. Achish had befriended him. Uh, the rest of the Philistines remained his enemies. So he has one Philistine leader who's giving him some safety net. But really, the rest of the Philistines hated him. Saul hated him. And David was surrounded by hate. And there may come a time, should the Lord tarry in his coming, when rather than being appreciated because you're a God-fearing family who keeps their lawn clean and goes to church and such a nice family, it could be that you are hated because you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a day in America when the pastor oftentimes would live next to the church and the old uh, settlements and the old towns and, and the pastor was often viewed upon as someone that was respected and someone whose opinion was desired and, and someone uh, uh, who, whose blessing was encouraged and, and yet more and more as America changes, that is not the view of church or pastors or Christians in general. And David describes his situation here by saying, mine enemies would daily swallow me up. It was especially distressing uh, for David. And may I remind you as we enter this new year, let us enter this new year soberly and let us remember 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Just as certainly as David's enemies wanted to wipe him off the map, Satan wants to wipe you off the map. He doesn't want you in God's house. He doesn't want you loving missionaries. He doesn't want you loving revival. He doesn't want you loving your family. He doesn't want you going far forward for God, there is an enemy that wants to devour you as well today. David says, I sense the presence of these enemies. But notice, secondly, he tells us about the plot of these enemies in verse 5. Notice what it says. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts against me are evil. His enemies took what he said and they changed the context. They misrepresented him. They must have worked for the modern day news agencies. <laughs> and oftentimes that is the case of journalism, so-called. Journalism will change what someone said. Journalism will skew the, the true meaning. And David said they're taking what I'm saying out of context. They're being untruthful all the day long. They are misrepresenting his righteousness. They're making him look like the bad guy. I remember a few years ago when Vice President Pence just simply made a statement that he as a married man would not have lunch alone with another woman other than his wife. Oh, the media made him to look like the weirdest guy on planet Earth. Why, what kind of a straight-laced weirdo is he? By the way, the same media that wants to elevate every kind of wickedness and every kind of a drag queen and every kind of ungodliness as being normal and wonderful and something to celebrate while they make fun of a moral, born-again Christian man. This is what David is talking about. David is saying, they take my good and they try to make it look bad. And you may face that. We all may face that. They were untruthful. In fact, his enemies were unscrupulous. Notice in verse 6. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. <laughs> They're just literally hoping to snuff him out. And here we see the reality of fear. Now, it's easy for all of us to say, oh, David, come on, you wrote the 23rd Psalm, get with the program, right? Come on. I mean, in our flesh. What about walking by the still waters? <laughs> what about the green pastures? What about his rod and his staff that comfort you? By the way, when someone is going through a life threatening situation, that's probably not the time to yell at them and remind them of certain things. <laughs> David said, at what time I am afraid. Thank God for people who can honestly say, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need you, Lord. I need your help. I need your guidance. And I submit to you 
on the first day of the new year that all of us should come to the Lord with that statement, Lord, I need you. Because raising a family in today's society is bigger than me. I'm going to be on a mission to get every teenage parent to get their children in Sunday school every Sunday, in youth group every Wednesday night, surrounded by the Word of God. I am on a, they, they will either enjoy and their children get involved, they're going to feel real uncomfortable with Pastor Chapel in 2023 because I am challenging every parent to get completely right with God and to get their children into the house of God because I'm telling you it is impossible without God to raise a godly family in 2023. The enemies are waiting everywhere to snuff your family out. The reality is a fear. But notice what that led David to. It led him to a renewal of trust. Very simple but very profound in verse 3. One of the great verses of the Bible. Notice it again. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Let's say that together. Ready? Begin. What time I am afraid, I will no matter where David looked, there were enemies. Saul and Israel, the Philistine warlord seeking him. There was only one place that he could look for hope, and that was to the Lord. Psalm 56, 3. I will trust in thee. And we must make a decision today to look to the Lord and to trust in him. We must make that choice this morning. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you every step of the way. And when it comes to trusting God, that means that we believe in his reliability. Ability. We believe that he will not let us down. We believe in his word, his ability, his strength. The Bible says, for example, that he cannot lie. We will trust in his word. Uh, that he always keeps his promises. That he loves us and has good in store for us. Trusting him means that we will always believe what he says about himself and about his word and his truth. We will trust in him in 2023. Now, this matter of trusting the Lord... I want you to see two principles related to trusting in the Lord. First, it is a volitional trust. That is to say, it is something of your will. Now, I said a moment ago, I'm going to challenge every parent of every teenager to get their teenagers, not just to Wednesday night church, uh, but to Sunday morning Sunday school. By the way, I may be old-fashioned. I believe in the Word of God, the house of God, the local church, and the Bible being taught to young people, and I'm going to stand by that. They need it. But as surely as you bring your children, we also understand they of their own volition must decide to follow God. Right. We, we can't force that. We understand that. But God help the parent who won't give their child a chance by getting them to the house of God. These are decisions that we make. They are volitional decisions. He says, very simply, I understand, verse 3, at what time I am afraid, what do the next two words say? Say it, please. I will. Say those two words, please. I, I will. I will. Perhaps you, like us, have made a will, your last will and testament. And you have willed certain things. God says, I want you to make a decision while you're still alive to trust me. I will do this. I will trust the Lord. Psalm 118.6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I will trust him. Psalm 27.14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 28 and verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped, Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be you afraid. When do you come to that place in your life? It is at the moment of complete trust given over to the Lord. History is replete with illustrations of men and women and boys and girls who trusted God in ways that we cannot understand because many of us have been so, so uh, comforted and sheltered, if you will, from real trials for our faith. But others in the past have paid a great price. I think of Nicholas Ridley, one of the British reformers, as he was sentenced in 1555 to burn at the stake 
by Queen Mary, a Roman Catholic queen who did not want this man's Protestantism, his protesting the church to go any further. He, she did not want his message of trusting Christ as Savior to advance. And so she determined that he would be burned there in Oxford. And on the night before Ridley's execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison just to give him any assistance or just to give him some companionship as he awaited his burning. And Nicholas Ridley declined his brother's offer, and he said these words, I intend, God willing, to go to bed and sleep as quietly tonight as I ever did. I intend, God willing, to go to bed and to sleep as quietly tonight as I ever did. How many of you would say that is a man trusting in God? At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And furthermore, David speaks of praising God. Notice in verse 4, he says, in God I will praise his word. He, he doesn't just say, I'm going to trust God. He says, I'm going to praise God in this moment. You know, one of the most powerful things we do every Sunday is when we stand and sing praise to God. In fact, sometimes I think we should sing even a little longer songs of praise and magnification. Why? Because it brings glory to God and it is helpful for us in the time of difficulty to just praise God and to say, God, we're still trusting you and we're still praising you. Things are a little crazy down here, but we still believe that you're a mighty God. And that's what he says in verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. Notice that phrase. It's, it's a peculiar phrase. We're not, we're not unaccustomed to someone saying, I'm going to praise the Lord. But he says, I'm going to praise his word. In God, I will praise his word. Psalm 56, 10. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. Psalm 33 and verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Listen, it's one thing to praise God. He is worthy. How about praising his word today? By the way, in the beginning was the word, and the word is with God, and the word was God. Praise God and praise the word of God. This is what David's saying. Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust your word. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise your word. And there are many praiseworthy attributes of God's word. I've listed a few in your notes this morning. There's the attribute of Scripture's necessity. We're reminded that, that what we need is to be found in God's word. It teaches us how to live and how to be saved. And, and, and it reminds us that while general revelation is wonderful, uh, the nature around us, the stars above us, uh, human reason cannot show us the gospel. What we need is God's gracious self disclosure. If we are to worship him rightly, we need to understand him clearly. And so there is the great necessity of the word of God. There is also the attribute of God's sufficient word. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, 3 verses 14 through 17, that the word of God is inspired. That is to say, it is God breathed. And that is to say that it is profitable for doctrine. It is profitable for correction. It is profitable for reproof. And, and, and the word Word of God is sufficient for us. It is the infallible word that we praise today. We don't praise Shakespeare as being infallible. We don't praise some other author, author as being all sufficient. But this book is all sufficient for our soul's needs. There is the attribute of its necessity. I cannot live without it. There is the attribute of its sufficiency. I can always trust it. There is the attribute of its clarity. Deuteronomy 13 gives us uh, 30, chapter 30 and, and verse number 14 says that the word of God is very nigh unto us. People say, oh, the Bible's hard to understand. Folks, uh, the, this, this King James Bible that I'm preaching from this morning, it's written at about a fifth grade level. It, listen, if you'll read it, you'll get something out of it every time. There are passages in the Old Testament, maybe the book of Leviticus, that, 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 that may have some history or may have some customs that you'll have to study or ask some questions about, which is why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. 
But God's word is something that is very nigh unto us or that is very understandable. It is helpful. It brings clarity to our life. The fourth attribute is the attribute of the authority of the word of God. Psalm 138 in verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The Word of God is a magnified, authoritative book, and of our own volition we must say, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee, and I will praise God's Word, and I will put my trust in His Word. The psalmist said, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. Ladies and gentlemen, get your heart fixed on God and on the Word of God today, and let nothing get you away from it in 2023. Only the Word of God will give you the light you need to get through this year. There must be this volitional decision. I will trust in thee. I will trust in thee. And then it must be a convictional decision. Again, parents with your children. You want to make sure this isn't just your conviction to trust Jesus, but it's theirs as well. Look at verse 7. It says this. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. David is here telling us, I believe of my own convictions that God can take care of mine enemies. He says in verse number seven, God cast down the people. In other words, David believes that God is his best defense. 1 Samuel 17, 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. Let's say that together. The battle is the Lord's. So the volitional aspect of it is to say, this is my decision. I'm trusting in the Lord. And the convictional aspect of it is to say, it is his battle and he can take care of all things political and economic and medical. The battle is the Lord. Say it again. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Now look here. Some of us, myself included, we can get involved emotionally and intellectually trying to fight battles that only God's going to win. Let me encourage you to trust the Lord in 2023. Lord, I can't, I can't, I can't change Congress. I can't, you know, take care of all the problems of the European Union. I can't get all the theologians to get along. They can't get along with their own dog or cat. Some of the things we expend great emotion on, we need to remember the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. For example, David, before his battle with Goliath, when David was of a pure heart, when he was like a child in his faith, 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took, out, took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. <laughs> In other words, David had this conviction that God could win really big battles. Do you have that conviction? Do you believe that God can win really big battles? If you don't believe that, next Sunday night will scare you half to death. Because next Sunday night, we're getting the slingshot out, and we're going to put some targets up, and we're going to trust God that the battle is the Lord's, and we're going to ask God to do some great things in helping us to reach our community and reach our world and to trust in Him. And this is a volitional decision. I will trust in the Lord, and this is a convictional decision because the battle is the Lord's. You say, yeah, but it's 2023, and, and, and all the good people are leaving California. 
And people don't even always listen about the Bible. And blah, 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 blah. There is still a God in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. And it is his battle. And in fact, God often does his greatest work in the most unlikely of places. I am thankful to God that I had Christmas in church last Sunday and New Year's in church this day. And I'm looking forward to what God has in 2023 because I will trust in him. That's a decision that I've made. And I want you to make that decision, that you will trust in the Lord. He will cast down the wicked. He will comfort his people. Notice in verse 8, thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Now this is a very touching verse, is it not? God is a comforting God. David said, I, I'm trusting you, Lord. At what time I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. I'm trusting you, Lord, but there's tears coming down my face, Lord. Put my tears in your bottle. This verse tells us that God cherishes the cries of his people. How many of you believe that the same God who can number the hairs on your head knows how many tears you'll shed this week? He keeps track of our tears. Literal bottles, he's able to do that. Or just speaking of his compassion, most certainly so. However you interpret the verse, may I say to you that what it teaches me is that I serve a compassionate God who keeps track of my fears and of my tears. He knows my hurts and he knows my heart and he cares for my soul. That's the God that we serve. Revelation 5, 8, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. God knows your prayers and God knows your cares. He doesn't just dismiss them. It's not like when you're a kid and you get all scratched and bruised and you come, you come to your dad and you go, Dad, I fell off my bike. And your dad goes, yeah, whatever, brush it off, boy. <laughs> That's not the God you serve. God knows your cares. God sees your tears. And he wants you to keep trusting him. And he'll bring just enough along your way to remind you that you need him. He'll... He'll allow just enough circumstances to keep you close to him. This past week, we had, a, we had our week plan, like, like every week. Every week has a plan every month, every year. We're going to see some relatives. We got in the car, and we we're on our way, and our son-in-law was with us, Peter, and our daughter, Danielle, and their boys. And, and uh, Peter, Peter said to me Sunday night, he said, man, I've got, I've, I've got some pain in my side and I said, ah, oh, brush it off. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> he, said, I, he said, I've got some pain in my side. And I said, well, I, I said, I got some Pepto-Bismol. I got some Tums. I mean, I, if you want any of it, let me know. I'll be okay. Boy, he wasn't okay Monday. Man, I'll tell you what. And uh, he ran into, we were, uh, we were about halfway between here and Phoenix. He ran into the, into the emergency room uh, at, the, at the Eisenhower Hospital. And you know, the craziest thing, I don't know how it exactly happened, they forgot to ask him if he had allergies to certain medicines. And uh, so just to help get him ready for his surgery, they put him into anaphylaxis shock. And he nearly died from it. I mean, he just he couldn't breathe. And now they're just jabbing him with epinephrine pins and trying to get him you know, back to where he could breathe. And so once he was in that condition, they went in for what was supposed to be just a simple appendectomy, you know, just... In one day, out one day. And, uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't like that for him. And uh, it was just a turn of events and just something that wasn't right. And extra bleeding and sepsis and this and that and sinus tachycardia and on and on and on. And we, we didn't plan, Terry and I, to spend our wedding anniversary at Eisenhower Hospital. Certainly, Peter and Danielle didn't plan it that way. And those are fearful times, are they not? When you hear certain words, 
like sepsis or certain words related to a, a heart rate. And by the will of God, he had me in this passage this week, and so I had a fresh reminder at what time I'm afraid. Then he developed, some of you are familiar with the term ilias. Our son Larry had it. Some of you may have had experience with it. Is that after your abdomen is open and you've had a surgery on the bowels, many times someone's, someone's bowels will go to sleep, literally. It's very painful, very painful. And we just prayed for the next few days that his bowels would wake up. When, when you have a loved one experiencing ileus, there's not a lot you can do except trust the Lord. It just, it takes time. It, it just takes time. They said, just try to get him to move. And he'd get, he got sick to get up and he couldn't, we tried to walk him around one in the morning, three in the morning, just trying to get him to move. So, so the ileus would, 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 his intestines would awaken. And thank the Lord, he came out of the hospital yesterday, still very weak. Pray for him. Normal hemoglobin's 14, his is 7 right now. Pray for him. You'll have these days in your life that you don't plan. But how many of you believe that God is a sovereign God? Amen. David didn't think, well, I'll kill Goliath and everybody will love that and surely Saul will... He, he didn't think Saul was going to hate him for killing Goliath. Sometimes life has its turns. And when you face the reality of fear, you must come back to the renewal of trust. And then notice finally in our passage, the rest of faith. God wants us to rest in faith. Notice if you would in this passage in verse 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Now let's read this verse together. All of you, business owners, moms, dads, single adults, teenagers, let's read this verse now. Read it all together, verse number nine. Ready, begin. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Now notice here how we can rest in faith. First, with confidence. This I know. It's nice to know some things. This I know. Here is the confidence of David, Psalm 118 in verse 6. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? This I know, that God is for me. I can completely put my confidence in this God because he's on my side. If God be for us, who can be against us? God is for me. I heard about a fellow named Oscar and his family was a little worried about him. He was getting ready to take his first flight. And they said, boy, we hope Uncle Oscar does all right. And on his first airplane flight, they were eager to hear how it went. And so they asked Oscar, how did you enjoy the flight? And Oscar said, well, he said, uh, it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. He said, but I'll tell you what. He said, I never did put all my weight down. You'll get that one after church. How many of you would agree with me? It'd be silly to be on an airplane thinking, Man, I can't really trust this plane. I'm not going to put all my weight down when you're in midair. <laughs> I never did put all my weight down. That's how silly it is to live the Christian life thinking, I better have my plan B. You know, God, I would trust you on this tithing thing, but just in case, I'll do it when I can. God... I would trust pastor on the whole thing about, you know, forsake not the assembly and bringing my teenager to church. But, you know, I've got bowling lead and I'm pretty good. I got four strikes last week. Woo, woo, woo. My teenager's on crack cocaine, but I got four strikes. You going to trust God or trust yourself? It would be kind of silly to go through 2023 partially trusting God. 
be kind of silly to get on a 747 and think, oh, oh, all right, well, here I am on it, but I'm not going to put all my weight down on this thing. You already are putting your weight down on this thing. God is for me. Do you believe that this morning? We don't always live that way. He is for you in salvation. He sent his son to die for you. He wants you to be saved. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God says, I'm so for you, I sent my son to die for you. How can we ever question whether he's for us? How can we ever question whether he cares when we're in the emergency room or the surgery room or wherever we might be this week? He is always for us. He proved that when he went to Calvary. He's for our strengthening. God's not, listen, God's not bringing these trials into your life to weaken you. He's bringing them into your life to strengthen you. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God says, I want to bring you, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God knows that if life is just a, a, a constant a time of blessing and never a time of strengthening and stretching, that we'll never become the men of God he wants us to be. We'll be soft. You'll never stand up in the day of threatening, in the day of tribulation, in the day of difficulty, if we can't stand up in the day of ease. Sometimes God allows trials to strengthen our faith along the way. Notice what it says there in Hebrews, or rather in Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, which means mature or complete, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, from now on, listen, some of you ought to claim this verse, that we will from now on be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Look it. God is for you. He is for you in your salvation he is for you in your strengthening. He is on your side. He is your comforter. He is your strength. He is your helper. He is your hope. He is there rooting you on. God is for you. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen. If God be for us, and he is, who can be against us? Now, when my boys played sports, I, I was never one of these get mad at the referee dads. I always was conscious of the fact that you're supposed to have a Christian testimony. <laughs> so if I really wanted to say something mean to the referees, I just said it to myself. Inside. I've, I've seen even pastors just screaming at referees, and, and uh, after a while, I've, I've, I've thought, man, I'd, I don't know if I'd want to go to that guy's church. And I never wanted our, our parents to be ashamed of their pastor's testimony. So I, I certainly tried to have a good testimony. But having said that, when my boys were out there playing, they knew that their dad was for them. Man, if, if they'd get the ball, I'd whistle, I'd, I'd, I'd clap, I'd jump up and down, I'd tell them, man, the good try, great shot, way to go, way to knock him down, you know, whatever, whatever they did, I, I wanted to be the dad that was there as often as I could be, rooting for them every step of the way. And dad, you'll never, you'll never regret that. The day will come, there's no more games. Now, when they're like in 10th and 11th grade, you're like, oh, Lord, please, let this teenage year, because you feel like a taxi driver. How many parents know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but I was rooting for them. When they would get hurt or when they've been sick, I've thought, I wish it was me in the hospital bed, not them. If we can feel that way as human fathers, think of the love of God. He is for you. 
There's a great cloud of witnesses in heaven today. Compass round about us. There's a Savior in heaven today. And he knows that we're in California. He knows we're in the starting block. He knows we're starting a brand new year. And he's telling us, I want you to keep trusting me. I'm still for you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He wants us to have confidence. He wants us to have a continuance with him. Verse 11, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. When I was a, when I was a teenager, we always used to sing this song at camp, I just keep trusting my Lord. I don't know, we have the words to that song, fellas. You have it back there? Hey, sing it with me if you know it. Let's sing it together, shall we? I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives a song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend. Such a faithful friend, I can count on him to the very end. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord, he will never fail. I know what the devil says. Well, you've been trusting him a long time, now just trust yourself. You can save this way and buy this and move here and today buy a little and tomorrow sell a little and you can have this idea and this friend and well, listen to what your accountant says and listen to what your kids say. And look at what it says on the internet. That must be true. <laughs> or you can keep trusting the Lord. That's right. I just keep trusting my Lord. Had we not trusted the Lord, the North Building would never have been built. Had we not trusted the Lord, this building would never have been built. Had we not trusted the Lord, tens of millions of dollars would have never been sent to missionaries. Had we not trusted the Lord, 3,000 graduates would not be out from this college serving the Lord around the world and preaching the gospel today. Had we not trusted the Lord, great and mighty things would never have been done at this church. I submit to you, dear church family, that we keep trusting our Lord. Amen. But pastor... It's different now than it was 35 years ago. You're telling me? <laughs> well, we used to go out and knocking on doors and we'd find these young families moving into Lancaster from down below, which I had, to, I had to learn in my early years here what down below was. They said, I'm coming up from down below. I'm like, really? <laughs> then I figured out that meant like Van Nuys or something. We meet these young couples and we'd lead them to the Lord and help them get in church, get discipled. We don't meet as many young couples anymore. Sometimes we meet a couple living together, not married. It takes time to help them understand God's design for marriage. Then we have to teach them that smoking marijuana is a sin. Even though the governor legislated that, that it's legal, that God wants us to have a sound mind We have to teach them basic things about where's Genesis in the Bible, where's Ephesians, where's Romans. Yeah, it, it takes a little longer, but what I have found is the power of the gospel is as strong as ever Amen. to change lives. You see, times have changed, but God hasn't changed. God is still for his church. God has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we close, I want you to see just an amazing little chapter here. Notice this in verse 13. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living how many of you are thankful that your soul has been delivered? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Can I ask you a question then? If you would trust God with your soul's destination, how about if we go ahead and trust him with 2023? 
He said, now, Pastor, I mean, I, I, can, I can trust God for heaven and for eternity, but like, I don't know if I can trust him for January or anything. Because, you know, I got I to gotta go with my gut. At what time I am afraid, I will trust in him. Let me give you five areas I want to challenge you to trust him in. First, you can trust him with your eternity. If you are sitting in this church house and you do not know that you will spend eternity in heaven, you do not know that you are heaven bound, you don't know that God is for you. You hope he is, but you don't know that. David apparently knew it. David said, God's for me. God keeps my tears in a bottle. He cares about me. But if you're not sure that God knows you and God cares for you, and you're not sure that there's a place for you in heaven, I want you to understand this morning that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have, have everlasting life. And when we come to Jesus and confess our sinful condition, and when we ask him to forgive us and to come into our lives and be our savior, he's not going to cast us out. He's going to receive us like he did the prodigal son. He'll rejoice in having us as his children. You can trust him with your eternity. You can trust him with your identity. The Bible teaches that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You say, well, I don't, I don't like the way I look. I don't like who I think I feel I might be. And, and, and I've, I've seen some things in the media kind of causing me to question. And I want to tell you something, dear friend. You can trust that God created you in his image and for his purpose. And you can trust God with your identity. He loves you. And by the way, young ladies, God thinks you're wonderful. And young men, God created you the way he wants you to be. And you don't have to try to change it or switch it. I don't care what kind of a perverted government would help somebody pay for it. If God says you're okay, you're okay. Hey, God, don't make junk. You can trust him for your identity. You can trust him this year for your provision. Say, boy, the economy. Ah. How about it? But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Sounds like God's got you covered there too. Right. Sounds like God has another contract for you. Sounds like God's got another job for you. Sounds like God's going to do something. Sounds like God can take care of you. Keep trusting him. Say, well, the business is changing. Oh, oh, God's got wisdom for you this year. God's got a provision for you this year. God is a trustworthy God. Not only will he provide for your eternity and your identity and your provision, can I say he'll provide for your family this year. He'll meet the needs of your family. I think of Hannah, how she lent her son Samuel to the Lord. She said, Lord, here's my, here's my son I want to give them to you. Hey, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, give your family to the Lord. Give your family to the Lord this year. You can trust him with your family. Oh, I'll trust him on Sunday morning, but on Sunday night, we're going to stay home and watch HBO. Why don't you trust him every day? Why don't you just get serious about trusting God this year? Trusting God all the time with your family. Let me say this. You can trust God with your serving. As you serve the Lord this summer, or rather this year, I want you to notice Joshua 14, verse 10. Notice what it says here. This is Caleb. I love this. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, and he hath, as he said, these 40 and 5 years, even since the day the Lord spake his word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, as yet, I am as strong this day as I was the day Moses sent me. <laughs> as my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. Now, come on. Caleb's up in his 80s. And I know, the older we get, things start changing. We get out of bed. It's like Rice Krispies, snap, crackle, pop. 
Some of you right now, you're saying, get over with this. My back's hurting me. I know your back's hurting you. But you need God's word this morning. We get headaches. We have this. We have that. You go to the doctor and the nurse asks you what kind of medicine you're on. You go, man, I'm on a lot of medicine. And the, the tendency is to say, you know, I just don't know if I can like, be a soul winner or you know, help in the nursery or sing up in the choir or be an usher or even get to church. for Go to church on a Wednesday? Because you know I'm a little older. How about Caleb? Now I know I'm 85. But I can still go out to battle and come back in. I want that mountain. Some of us ought to be praying, God, give me the spirit of Caleb this year. And you can trust God for that. You can trust him. Trust him when dark doubts assail thee. Trust him when thy strength is small. Trust him when to simply trust him seems the hardest thing of all. Trust him. He is ever faithful. Trust him for his will is best. Trust him for the heart of Jesus is the only place of rest. Trust in him. You can trust him. And I pray 